Welcome to the SEG 20 Online Experience and the Applied Science Education Program. My name is Jack Caldwell, and I'm the chair of this year's Applied Science Education Program. This program has been part of the Society of Exploration Geophysicists Annual Meeting for many years. It has provided high school students the opportunity to visit the annual meeting to visit the exhibition floor, to find out about geoscience in general, and to get some information about what careers in geophysics might be like. Because of the virtual format of this year's program, the opportunity exists for many more students, teachers, parents, and in particular, society members who are parents of school-aged children to participate in this program. This year's program features two outstanding presentations. One is by Erica Lopez, the chief meteorologist for a TV station in Austin, Texas. And the other is by Johannes Duma, a geophysicist with Casillas Petroleum in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. We hope that you find both of these presentations entertaining, educational, and motivating. Normally at this point, I would do some, some kind of introduction for Erica Lopez but she does such a fantastic job of introducing herself and telling us how she got started in meteorology and how her, her career has progressed that I'll just let her get on with it. I only say that the SEG is very fortunate to have her as a keynote speaker. Erica, welcome. Hello, Houston. I am meteorologist Erica Lopez, now chief meteorologist Erica Lopez in Austin, Texas. And um, when I was invited to speak with you guys, I was actually in Houston uh, working as a meteorologist at KHOU. It's a CBS station there in the Houston area. But um, my old job called me back and asked if I was interested in the chief position. So uh, that's why I'm just about two hours down the road and couldn't pass up the offer. But again, I'm so happy to talk with you guys. I'm sorry that I can't be in there in person. Um, I know these times are strange and difficult for all of us, but I'm still very excited to talk about my path, my journey of becoming a meteorologist and a broadcast meteorologist also. And hopefully, you know, you can follow me on social media or email me any questions, message me any questions in any form. Um, and I'd love to be in contact if there's any way that I can help any of you guys that may be interested or girls, guys or girls that may be interested in this field. Okay, so I'm going to start off with my story of how I originally became interested in weather. I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. I also grew up in an inner city. Um, so a lot of my friends, uh, all basically all the students in my high school, they were all minorities, um, came from lesser income family households, and we didn't have that many resources. Um, so I would say the majority of my friends that I grew up with did not go to college. Um, they don't have a career. Um, they really didn't have any dreams. And if they did have any dreams, they didn't have the support system to pursue that dream. Or they thought it would be too difficult. Or how am I going to afford college, university? Um, you know, my family's struggling to even put food on the table. So that's the environment I grew up in. I grew up with such a, you know, loving parents, though. They're very supportive of whatever I wanted to do. Um, so in Arizona, if you know anything about the desert Southwest, there's not much weather that goes on. If I ever went back to work as a meteorologist in Arizona, um, it's actually very quiet and I'd probably get bored uh, because it's either hot and I'm talking like 110, 115 degree stretch um, heat in the mid of the summer, 
Or there is one season where it actually does get stormy and it does get kind of busy and it's called monsoon season. So monsoon season is what interests me uh, as a young little girl um, into becoming a meteorologist. But it interests me, although I did not believe in myself. So what I would do is I was always so fascinated with the weather. I had so many questions. Why does it storm in the afternoon? but it usually doesn't rain in the mornings, right? I, I would have these questions um, that I would analyze. How does a haboob or a dust storm, how does that happen, right? So I was very intrigued. Um, and then I loved watching the news. I love watching the newscast, um, but my favorite part of the newscast was when the meteorologist came on, right? I love the production. I love studying how anchors would toss reporters and why they did this and why they spoke this way. And everyone was so eloquent and great and professional, but the meteorologists had something extra special. They were allowed to be as nerdy as they possibly could. And on top of that, uh, they ad-libbed everything. So I just thought they're a little more awesome than the rest. Um, anywho, so put those two and two together. Loved observing the weather, loved, sorry, I have my cell phone here. And oh, I actually need my cell phone open to look at my notes to make sure I cover everything for you guys. Um, but I loved, you know, observing the weather in Arizona. And then I loved the meteorologists on air on TV. So I would always joke around and I was probably about, you know, maybe in sixth, seventh grade, maybe a little younger. I, I was very interested in news and about fifth, sixth grade. Um, and then seventh, eighth grade is kind of when I started joking, I'm going to be a weather girl, right? I'm going to be a meteorologist. I didn't know the difference of a weather girl and a meteorologist, but I didn't quite believe in myself. So I made a joke out of it. And, um, but then when it came to the time of graduating high school and I was terrible at math, let me tell you, I was not the best student. Um, I was a little bit of a rebellious child also. Um, and you know, my teachers would tell me, um, Erica, did you know if you wanted to be a weather girl or a meteorologist that it requires a lot of math? And I got so nervous and I thought I can barely pass algebra. I failed algebra two times in high school. I can barely even get through algebra. How am I going to get through calculus? Right. Um, I did, you know, uh, finish high school. I graduated from high school and I still did not know what else I wanted to study. So I thought might as well just go for meteorology. I did go to community college for my first two years, which I highly recommend. And it was the best choice for me, um, because it was so much cheaper and so much get hands on. I, I don't want to say easier, but because it's not easier, but your classes are smaller. You have more one on one time with teachers. And I lived in the tutor center because I'm, I worked my butt off, uh, to pass math. And little did I know I was terrible at algebra in high school, but I was actually okay at, uh, calculus. So they're completely different maths, right? So I put my heart and soul in it. It was tough. I did cry. I did want to quit. At one point I thought I was going to change my major to, um, geography or geology because meteorology was too difficult for me. But then I thought, you know what? We only live one life and I'm not going to be happy with myself if I don't pursue my one dream. This was literally my one dream. Um, long story short, I finished community college and it was time for me to transfer. I wanted to go to the best school for meteorology, right? So I applied to um, what I thought were the top two best meteorology schools. Um, there's so many great programs across the country, but I did apply to Penn State and then I applied to Mississippi State. Uh, Mississippi State did accept me right away and they have a great broadcast meteorology program and a great online program also. But then Penn State um, accepted me very late, very last minute. I think the month was June. The semester started in August or early September, I can't remember. And they barely accepted me in June. So, um, I had to, you know, turn my life plans around and, and plan to move to Pennsylvania within two months. Um, and I went to 
Penn State, and it was very difficult. Um, and not only difficult for the schooling, but also difficult for my personal life. It was my first time being away from home. Um, it was a culture shock growing up in the desert Southwest and going to the East coast. The weather impacted me immensely, dark, gloomy days. I do not thrive in dark, gloomy days. So it made my life a little hard. Um, and I now consider myself a Penn state dropout. So I only lasted one semester there. So now I have two huge hurdles, right, that are in front of me in order to become a meteorologist. I'm terrible at math. Um, I failed my dream school and I'm going back home. I still did not give up. And believe it or not, dropping out of Penn State and failing a lot of my classes and going back to Arizona State actually was the best situation for me and was a blessing because that's where I was supposed to be. And after I graduated from the program, which was still very difficult, um, if anything, it was harder because the program at Arizona State was so smaller that the professor was a lot more tough on you. Um, but separating myself from the normal schools that meteorologists grow or graduate from, such as Penn State or Mississippi State, um, it separated my resume and it kind of stuck out. So I graduated and it was time to apply to my first job. And I had no idea what I was in for. All I knew was that I was pursuing my dream. And I got my first job in Victoria, Texas um, in 2014. So in the news industry, you start off um, in a small market and then you work your way up. So um, this market, it was a culture shock as well. Growing up in the desert Southwest, my only experience living, leaving home was moving to the East Coast. It was terrible. Um, and then I got a job as a weekend meteorologist and weekday reporter. Let me remind you, um, I didn't know anything about reporting, but they just kind of threw you in there. And I learned so much about the business. I was terrible at reporting. And I will never go back and look at uh, the work that I did, but I did learn a lot about the industry and about departments that I would not have learned about if I didn't have that opportunity. So um, from Victoria, Texas, I went on to my second job and that was in Colorado. I got a job with a national news um, station called Weather Nation, which is based out of Denver, Colorado, Denver, is amazing. And I loved the experience of being able to forecast nationally. On top of that, I was able to work with so many meteorologists across the country. And one of the things that has helped me most, most in this career are the relationships that I have built and um, who I work alongside, because I'm someone who soaks up so much knowledge. I'm not great at schools and textbooks and um, sitting in front of a computer and learning that way. I'm someone who is hands-on. I love absorbing inf information, having uh, conversations with other people and just asking questions. And I grew very fast, not only meteorologically, but also on air when I worked with Weather Nation. So that was a huge blessing in my career as well, because after Weather Nation, I was there for two years, I was able to land my job as a morning meteorologist in Austin, Texas. So you get the picture, you travel a lot as a um, someone who works in news in general, because you have contracts, your contract is anywhere from one to about three years, sometimes even larger. Uh, but most of the times on average, they're about two year contracts. So I got my job in Austin, Texas, which is what brought me back to Texas. And I was so happy because um, once I left Texas after my job in Victoria, I knew I was going to come back. And I think I should have been born a Texan because I absolutely love this state. So um, I learned so much about Central Texas weather. And so far in my career, I, you know, I've moved from Victoria to Denver to Central Texas. And my favorite thing about working in this industry is learning the meteorology in every single location that I have lived in because it's very different. Uh, the meteorology in each location, it, you know, the topography, the geography, it impacts a lot of 
what's going to uh, bring out the biggest vulnerabilities in the local community, right? So it's very important to be aware with what what are um, the areas that are very prone to flooding or what are the areas that deal with um, extremely high winds or what are the areas that, you know, are very prone to, say, fire danger. Every single situation, every single location in this country is impacted by the weather for the better or for the worse, um, in their own way. Um, After my two years here in Austin, I work for a company where you're able to transfer within the company. So I found an opening, and because of my networking and my relationships that I have built, I was able to get the job in Houston. I was only in Houston for one very short year, and I'm very sad to not be in Houston because it is an amazing market. Um, it is a top 10 market in the country. So again, you start small and you work your way up, but it's not all about the market size either um, because after my one year in Houston, I decided to come back to Central Texas, which is considered a medium-sized market, but for a better position for the chief meteorologist position. Um, which is a a blessing. It is very rewarding. Um, It is very challenging and it's, it's a lot of pressure. But again, if you love what you do, and I absolutely love what I do, and I love the community so much here in Austin, Texas, Um, I feel responsible for everyone here. And it really sometimes is a life or death situation. So I take this job very seriously. Yes, it's fun. Yes, you get to put on dresses and put on makeup. And that's all um, things you learn on the way with consultants or with, uh, you know, um, sharing tips with your coworkers or your girlfriends. Um, Even men wear makeup too. Um, But it's just, it's something that... It's an, I was an opportunity I couldn't pass up. And um, so now I'm here for three years. And since I am still within the company, um, I can be asked to go back to Houston to help out. As a matter of fact, a lot of what we do is so digital and technology-based now. So during the past hurricane, um, I was able to help out with a hurricane that made landfall across um, southwest Louisiana, Hurricane Laura. I was able to help out digitally for KHOU. So I'm still a part of the team technically. I will always love the Houston area and KHOU for what I learned there. I learned very, very fast, very rapidly. Um, that is an area where it is a life or death situation a lot. As you know, living in the Houston area, flooding is a major concern there. Um, so, um, let me see, let me look at my list. I feel like I'm just talking and I keep rambling and I hope I'm not boring you guys, but I am 15 minutes in. So I, I spoke about the fact that, um, you know, how I grew up and what interests me, my path, places I've worked. I'll talk a little bit about hurricane forecasting. Um, and then that was kind of all, all on my list. Okay, sorry, I got sidetracked there. So hurricane forecasting, um, it's it's difficult. Uh, and the reason for that is because you're working with a system that is so, you know, long. It, the, the duration, it could last weeks. It could last up to a month um, from when we are monitoring a disturbance in the Atlantic, in the Caribbean, in the Gulf of Mexico. There's so many aspects to it, um, so many ingredients that can trigger the strengthening or the weakening of a system. And also what kind of interaction it has. Uh, Does it interact with land masses? Does it interact with wind shear? Wind shear is change of winds with height because hurricanes don't like wind shear. That will tear apart a storm. Is it moving into an area where it has dry air within that area? If it does have dry air, how high does that air go up? At what level of the atmosphere are we talking about at the surface or are we talking um, dry air aloft in the higher levels of the atmosphere? Um, Is it entering into a body of water that is mid to upper 80 degree temperatures? Is there upwelling going on in that um, area due to a previous storm, right? There's so many different factors and I'm not 
you know, I am not, um, the best at forecasting hurricanes by any means. I have only been in the industry for six years, but what I've really appreciated was working alongside the meteorologists there at KHOU who have been doing it, some of them for decades, um, such as the chief meteorologist, David Paul. And, uh, again, that has been the the best thing in my career. And I really appreciate all of my experiences and all of my uh, time, even though the Houston area, it was only one short year, um, but that really brought a huge impact to my career and my life. And I wouldn't have had this opportunity to move back to Austin as a chief meteorologist if it wasn't for my Houston opportunity. So um, I really wish this was an in-person scenario so I can answer questions, but I do please ask you guys um, to reach out to me if you have any questions, any interests within my career, within um, my story, with, um, you know, if, if you're interested in meteorology, if you're nervous about it or just have any questions, I am here for you. Again, my name is Erica Lopez. You can find me on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Um, and I hope you guys reach out and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Talk to you soon. Bye. I hope you as viewers found Erica's talk as interesting and enjoyable as I did. The SEG is really indebted to Erica for participating in the Applied Science Education Program. Erica, Thank you very, very much. The next presentation is by Johannes Duma. He's currently a geophysicist with Casillas Petroleum in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Like Erica, he began his career in 2014 working for Semerex Energy. And he's had a variety of positions doing geophysical work, both with Semerex and with Casillas. He's progressed through doing various types of geophysical work to where he is now managing oil and gas properties in Southern Oklahoma for Casillas Petroleum. Johannes obtained a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in geophysics from Colorado School of Mines. And he's going to share his thinking with us about what you can do with a background in geophysics, what some colleagues of his have done with that background, and then what he's done in his career in the oil and gas industry. Johannes, welcome to the ASAP program. We're fortunate to have you as a speaker as well. Hello, my name is Johannes Duma. I'm a senior exploration geoscientist at Casillas Petroleum. And today I'm gonna to be presenting to you on geophysics, a broad option in this changing world. So what is geophysics? Geophysics is a study and exploration of physical properties and processes of the earth in the surrounding space environment. That's everything from below you underground in the subsurface to above you in space, meteorology, and planetary geophysics. An analogy would be the medical imaging of the Earth. Just like in the medical field, if you have a knee injury, a common practice would be to get an MRI taken of your knee to see what's going on beneath your skin prior to an operation. Or to look at how is your baby developing, you would go to the doctor and get an ultrasound taken where they send sound waves down that reflect back off and are able to then characterize and see how the baby is doing and progressing without having to go inside. We do the same thing with geophysics on a much larger scale, both characterizing the subsurface for oil and gas exploration potentially, or up in space to characterize planets. So what do you study? Well, geophysics is an interdisciplinary and an applied science. So you study a broad range of topics from physics, mathematics, geology, computer science, and chemistry. But what I love about getting a geophysics degree and why part of the reason I went into it is because 
you learn such a broad range of topics that as you progress throughout your study in your undergraduate and then graduate school, if you so choose to, you can pick your electives where you want to gain more experience in. In my case, that was mathematics and computer science during my undergraduate degree. And during graduate school, I really found a new passion for geology and rock characterization when it came to oil and gas exploration. And so it doesn't necessarily preclude you from going and only allowing you to stay in that one field you had so early on chosen. If your passions and desires change throughout your study, you have the flexibility to change what direction you move. So where can geophysics take you? Well, because geophysics provides one such a broad technical background, there are a lot of options. And rather than me just telling you the different jobs and careers it might take you, I thought it could be very cool um, to show you um, several of my classmates and friends throughout my undergraduate and graduate degree that went into different career paths, from the tech industry in Silicon Valley to field work, international, whether it's oil and gas or business analyst, to the standard oil and gas path. So the first person I want to highlight was Lu Ming Liang. So he got his master's and then PhD from Colorado School of Mines. He majored in computer science, but he had a minor in geophysics. And he was a researcher um, for the Center of Wave Phenomenon, which is a research group, part of the Department of Geophysics at Colorado School of Mines. I, at the time, was doing research as well at Center for Wave Phenomenon, which is how we ended up meeting. Well, at the time, his research was focused on image processing, and that translated to him graduating and actually getting a job at Microsoft as a data scientist and software engineer. He then joined Uber as a software engineer working as an Uber advanced technology group and in their information extraction from imagery team. He most recently in 2019 joined Microsoft, again as a senior researcher now, working on computational photography. But to bring the story full circle, what I found was so neat is that his current intern student is a geophysical PhD candidate at UT Austin. Lu Ming could have picked a number of different intern student and candidates, but his current intern student is a geophysicist working on his PhD degree at UT of Austin. And part of the reason being these geophysicists, just like I highlighted, have such a broad skill set and have an ability to solve very challenging pro um, problems. The next person I want to highlight was Georgie. I met her during my undergraduate studies at Colorado School of Mines. After she obtained her bachelor's degree, she joined Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where she got her master's of science. After graduating, she joined the Sea Education Association. You can see her there in the top right. At the time, she was working as a science operations coordinator, managing a fleet of scientific equipment aboard two sailing school vessels used for study abroad programs. Well, in 2019, she joined Cyrus NOAA as a bathymetry data manager. So in the bottom left, you see her collecting magnetoluric data inside the caldera of a volcano on an island in Alaska. This work included two research cruises on university vessels, as well as one month of field deployments on shore. This project used seismic and magnetoluric methods to study mantle melt generation and migration beneath the volcano. So I've highlighted now going into the tech Silicon Valley path or even into field work. The next path I want to highlight was another classmate, Detshai, who goes by the nickname of Pac. I met him during our undergraduate studies and then um, we both graduated at the same time from our bachelor's and then master's. We both also did our research at the Center for Wave Phenomenon, which again was one of these research groups as part of the Department of Geophysics at Colorado School of Mines. Well, during his studies, he did an internship as numerous large oil and gas companies within the United States. But after graduation in 2014, he joined PTT EP, which is a national petroleum exploration and production company dedicated to providing sustainable petroleum supply to Thailand and the countries they operate. He's now currently team lead geophysical operations in Malaysia exploration projects. 
So you can see him there on the right. Um, that's a photo of him in one of their corporate offices. And then in the bottom left, him on one of these seismic vessels acquiring and collecting this new seismic acquisition offshore for one of the projects that he was working. So he was not only getting exposed to the corporate and the business side, um, handling technical projects, but also going out into the field I'm um, looking and managing one of these larger scale acquisitions. The last person I want to highlight was Andrew, who goes by the nickname of AJ. And so I met him during my undergraduate studies at Colorado School of Mines. After he obtained his bachelor, he went to UT Austin to get his master's in geophysics. Once he graduated, he joined Equinor in 2016 as an exploration geophysicist working on the regional Gulf of Mexico, GOM team. He then joined the Mexico Deep Shallow Water Prospect Evaluation. But now most recently, he moved abroad um, to Norway, where he's now currently crude oil valuation and analyst. This position is part of a one-year program called the Global Development Program, where in a small selection of experienced candidates are admitted. And these participants work within a role outside of their main business area. He's doing nothing geophysics related. To gain exposure to high profile personnel in Equinor, travel regularly to different offices and understand Equinor's core businesses from the inside out. So what does he do on a day to day? Well, he works to help now convey the technical value of crude oils from all over the world in order for traders to capture the full value potential of oil itself and the marketed products. So, so, so specifically, recently he's been developing apps to summarize this information and distribute it to those who need it. So his day-to-day -day now involves nothing geophysics related. You can see him there in the top right on one of his many hiking trips in the beautiful Norway landscape. And there in the bottom left in the offices on one of his first days when he got there in Norway. Well, what about my path? Well, I did both my undergraduate and graduate studies at Colorado School of Mines, during which I gained a broad skill set in all the different topics from physics, mathematics, computer science. As I mentioned in my undergraduate studies, I focus on mathematics and computer science, and then during my graduate studies on geology. But you don't just learn about these larger topics. You also get exposed to the different careers you can go into throughout your studies to make sure that you're chasing something you're very passionate about. Such as in this case here, this was me doing field work during one of our field camps. Um, this was junior year of my undergraduate studies. That's me in both photos laying out a seismic line in Pagosa Springs, Colorado, where we were working on characterizing and understanding the hot springs in Pagosa Springs by characterizing the subsurface. So this was a very unique opportunity that's common for undergraduate studies in geophysics to, to show you um, the actual collection of data rather than just being inside in your office or on campus analyzing the data. You also want to learn and appreciate how do you collect the data correctly. Well, outside of the topics I had mentioned, one of the passions I had during my undergraduate and graduate degree, graduate degree was research. And so I had the ability during my undergraduate studies to already begin doing research projects. This is me in the bottom left presenting to a large audience of geophysicists on my recent developments um, of my research and publications. And what was so neat and cool about this experience was that I was able to start first theoretical with new mathematical and physics equations, then brought it to the numerical world programming in computer software these um, um, theoretical equations to see does this work in a numerical model and then lastly there in the photo on the right taking all of those learnings and seeing does my research actually work in a real world environment by applying it and in this case to a cement block to characterize what was going on inside of that cement block all of this said i graduated uh, with my master's in geophysics in 2014 and then joined Simerex Energy full-time. This here is a photo of me in 2012 during one of my internships at Simerex Energy wearing a full fire retardant um, gear, getting ready to go out into the field for the first time 
to see a rig out in action drilling a well and being able to go out to location to some of our wells that are currently producing oil and gas uh, to see what that really looks like rather than just being in the office and crunching the numbers. What I want to highlight as well is once you graduate um, with your degree and you pick a company to go start your career with, don't just only look at the company you join, but also the mentors that you'll be assigned and be exposed to during your time there. Because that's such an important um, piece of your, your career path and your development is those early on time mentors that you, you get exposure to. And in this case, for me at Simmerx Energy, I had some phenomenal mentors that really paved the way for me uh, to where I am today, giving me that strong foundation to what I apply on a day-to-day -day, uh, now in the oil and gas industry. And not just that, throughout my time at Simmerx Energy, being exposed to many different projects, different teams in different areas, such that I continue to grow my skill set in a broad range of topics. So what did I work on in a day-to-day -day at Simmerex? Well, I started off working on characterizing the subsurface and improving our characterizations. The shown here is an image where on the y-axis you have depth sub C. So that's how deep you are below the, the ground. In black here, we show uh, the horizontal well that we drill coming down into the ground, hitting the rock that we want to be in, and then going horizontally, drilling for about another mile long. The colors in here is us imaging the subsurface, just like an MRI. In this case, the hot colors, the yellow and reds and the greens, denote the rock that we want to be in. The blue is this hard, tight rock that we want to avoid at all costs for two main reasons. One, it's tougher to drill, so it takes a longer period of time. Secondly, is because that rock doesn't produce the same. And so if we can be in this rock that's these hotter colors, we should produce hopefully more oil and gas. Well, this was a well that was drilled pre-seismic before we had these images of the subsurface. Because of that, we went in and out of our target rock, the rock that we wanted to be in, the yellow color. This is a sandstone. And so we went in and out of the rock we wanted to be in, constantly hitting this harder, tighter rock that slowed down our drilling. Because we went in and out of the, the, this harder rock, it ended up taking us nine days to drill just the horizontal part of this well. Well, we then followed up by creating these images of the surface and characterizing what was going on down below. And this allowed us to generate a new seismic design for how we wanted to drill our horizontal well, shown here in black. This is our final result, our final executed well. And we were targeting this yellow, these, this, this rock that is the best quality rock that we could possibly be in that should hopefully drill faster and produce a better result. Well, here's the final rocks that came up to the surface that we were able to see. All sandstone, all this yellow rock. Because we were able to stay in that for the entire length of the horizontal well, it only took us two days to drill this. So we were able to cut seven days just out of the horizontal part of this horizontal well. And you can estimate that every day costs about $30,000 for that giant rig to be out here on location drilling this horizontal well. So just by saving those seven days, we were able to cut $200,000 off of the cost. And not just that, we are able to stay within the rock we wanted to, avoiding that harder, tighter rock, thereby producing a better well and producing more oil and gas. So this is a win-win in our books. Another project I worked on was the earthquakes that were ongoing in Oklahoma at the time that I worked at Cimerex. So shown here on the right is a map of the United States with a blue box denoting Oklahoma. So as we zoom in on Oklahoma, shown here are the blue dots representing every earthquake greater than magnitude four. These occurred north of Oklahoma City and west of Tulsa. 
So what was going on in Oklahoma to cause these earthquakes? What's shown here is a map from 2014 to the end of 2015, a two-year time period exactly. During this time, there were 12,029 earthquakes that occurred within the state of Oklahoma. The majority of these events occurred north of Oklahoma City and west of Tulsa. So every brown circle that you see here on the map represents an event that was recorded and reported by the OGS, the Oklahoma Geological Survey. The blue triangles represent the stations where we are recording these earthquakes. So they're spread all throughout Oklahoma. So we make sure that we don't miss a single event. So there were a lot of earthquakes that occurred during this two year time period. Why, why did these occur? Well, the hypothesis was that some of the oil and gas plays produce large volumes of water with oil. So here's a little image to highlight that. You have a producing well and you drill down to the rock that you want to be in. What comes up is your oil here in that, that darker color and in blue, your water. The oil is sent to your oil tanks and the water is now sent with this line all the way to this wastewater disposal well. And so this produced water coming up from the formation has to be disposed of. And it's being disposed into this disposal well where you inject the water back down into the ground, way down deep into a formation in Oklahoma called the Arbuckle Formation, which sits just above basement faults. So as this disposed, um, disposal water was being injected into the subsurface, you're increasing the pore pressure, which was inducing failure and causing these faults to slip. To highlight this over time, in Oklahoma, you have here on the x-axis time, on the y-axis, monthly frequency of events. So how frequently did an earthquake greater than magnitude three occur within the state of Oklahoma? Well, before 2009, it was zero to maybe one earthquake per month. Well, between 2015 to 16, it peaked at 100 earthquakes per month that were greater than magnitude three. Well, during that time period, the Oklahoma Corporation Commission uh, enacted new guidelines and regulations to make an impact on disposal wells within Oklahoma to work on reducing the seismicity and the frequency of the earthquakes occurring within the state of Oklahoma. And you can see that those new regulations and guidelines made a significant impact reducing the frequency of earthquakes where today we're almost back now to zero earthquakes a month greater than magnitude three, a great success. In order to highlight that visually on a map, here are all the earthquakes recorded and um, reported by the Oklahoma Geological Survey over the last two years. That same time length as previously shown, now just on the most recent two year time. So rather than having 12,000 earthquakes occur in a two year time period, we're now down to 724 earthquakes represented by these brown circles and now spread throughout the state of Oklahoma. So this has made a significant impact. So where am I today? Well, in 2018, I joined Casillas Petroleum, where I'm a lead geoscientist managing um, one of our recent assets that we acquired from Chevron in Southern Oklahoma. And the reason I made the change from Simerex was I wanted to gain more business experience managing the full cycle of an oil and gas asset from acquiring a new asset to developing and exploring where do we drill, how do we drill, and then drilling those wells to then selling the assets to another company. And this has been a great experience and has continued to grow my skill set. So in conclusion, Geophysics is a broad interdisciplinary and an applied science, as it gives you the ability to go into a multitude of scientific fields, and it teaches you how to solve challenging problems, and that's key. You not only have that broad skill set, but you learn how to solve very challenging problems, and that skill set transfers to any industry, as I've highlighted, whether that's tech, business analyst, going out into the field, planetary geophysics, oil and gas. It's 
So I hope with that, that I've uh, intrigued you enough to potentially consider geophysics as one of the degrees that might interest you for college. Well, I want to thank you guys for this time. I really enjoyed doing this and uh, hopefully uh, talk to you again sometime. Thank you very much. Well, that was, that was a neat way to show how starting out in geophysics can lead to way different career paths. And to show how a background in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics gives one a lot of flexibility in career choices. As was the case with Erica's presentation, the SEG is really indebted to you for participating in the Applied Science Education Program. We appreciate the effort you made and the time you took to participate in this program. Thank you very much. This concludes the Applied Science Education Program for SEG 20 Online Experience. If you'd like to view these presentations again, please go to the SEG channel on YouTube. We hope that you found these presentations interesting, informative, and inspiring. Thank you for joining us for this program.